Hi, I'm John Hope Bryant, founder and chairman and CEO of Operation Hope. This is the Hope Global Forum annual meeting 2020, America on Reset, Healing a Nation, Opportunity for All. I'm here with my friend, John Donahoe, who's CEO of Nike. We're gonna have a very rich and important conversation, but this is one I need to contextualize um, because I keep saying you don't do business with companies or governments or communities, you do business with people. And we're not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience and energy matters. And I love people's story because it gives texture and context for where they came from and how they operate. And to say that John is the CEO of Nike does him a disservice and doesn't explain anything. Um, we're gonna get into some serious stuff with the commitments they've made, what they're doing around social justice uh, in this era and what's, how does that, what does that mean to you? It's gonna get very serious, but let me back up for a minute uh, because I have a personal experience with John and it, it made no sense until I understood his story. John was, was raised in Illinois, he was born in Illinois. And uh, John's father was, I believe, an accountant. And um, so he comes from a middle class, a middle class family. And um, his father uh, uh, knew someone who worked, I believe, at a bottling company. And because of that relationship, John was able to get his first job out of high school, I believe. And we've not talked about this, but but that was a hookup. That was relationship capital. It wasn't in the corporate suite, but but it still counts. In other words, he didn't have to go fill out an application somewhere, or uh, he didn't have to go you know, show his medal. He didn't have to go to a, prove he was a good bottler or whatever the job was. It was relationship capital that allowed him the opportunity to play in the game. And, uh, and John and I met at a private meeting uh, that doesn't even have a website. <laughs> and for no good reason, John introduces me after we have a conversation with a, another guy who's become a good friend, uh, Dan Schulman, who is the CEO of PayPal, where John happens to be chairman of the board. But none of this was obvious and nobody was claim, naming titles, all that kind of stuff. It just was his friend. And just like the guy hooked up John through his father uh, for his first job, um, he saw something in me and he said, you need to meet Dan Schulman and um, come here. Let, let's, let's have, let's, let me, let, let's go find him. Now, it wasn't like, let's send an email or happy talk. Or I'll get a hold of you later. Let's go find him. <laughs> and we went and met him. And then Dan and I, we fell in love. <laughs> yeah, Dan's a good guy. And Dan and I now have a friendship on our own and a partnership uh, between PayPal and Operation Hope. I, we haven't talked to John since. John, John made the introduction, went off on his own, handling his own business, uh, and didn't want anything, didn't want credit, didn't, didn't need us to check in, just did it because it was the right thing to do. But I, I think that connects with a third story. And again, John and I haven't talked about any of this. I could be completely wrong. But uh, why is John at Nike? Now, you're talking about a finance and a tech guy. <laughs> He was at ServiceNow, big software company. He helped to run Bain and Company, big consultancy firm for 20 years, went from a fairly modest level to CEO, was at eBay Marketplace, I believe, and was responsible for a bunch of acquisitions. I think, I think StubHub was one of them, but he'll explain that. But a bunch of acquisitions, some of which you, 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 you would have heard about. This is illustrious career in tech and uh, in uh, in finance, why the heck is he at a company called Nike? It's not exactly an elegant fit, but if if you're trying to change culture, if you're trying to connect the dots, if you're trying to get a hold of the soul of America and the world, if you're trying to understand how you can do well and do good, Nike is one of the best and most important emotional brands in the world. In a in a space and a place where people actually, on occasion, agree. Sports. <laughs> Um, and I think that John's on a bigger mission. I, I could be again completely dead wrong, but I'm going to shut up now and let John speak. But I, I want to thank him publicly for just 
uh, being decent and doing and staking me for no good reason. This is what everybody should do, by the way. What John did is what everybody should do, and is what I try to do every week. Stake somebody just because it's the right thing to do. It was a hand up, not a hand out. Uh, it's giving, it's teaching folks to fish at scale. Okay, John, re re react to what I said. What's wrong? What's right? What's on point? Uh, what's your reaction? <laughs> Well, first of all, thank you, John, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this wonderful conference. I will tell everyone at this conference, I met this John, John Bryant, at lunch, uh, the conference he was referring to, and, and Bill Bradley, Senator Bradley, brought us together. And it took about 15 minutes for both my wife and I to become completely inspired and captivated by not just, John Bryant, what your vision is for for I'll call it financial inclusion, but also just your, your willingness to engage in real topics, real issues, and in a way that just, I think we probably had a two hour lunch conversation that day. And so you are so inspiring. You tell a funny story. I, I'll also, I hadn't thought about this in a while. That job was actually working on a Schlitz beer truck as a temporary driver. I had to join the Teamsters at 17 years old. Yeah. And in my first week, the route I was put upon was Caprini Green in Chicago. Where, <laughs> and so it was an exposure to a world that I had not seen up to that stage of my life. And it made such an impression that whole summer for me, working in the inner city of Chicago on that Schlitz beer truck as a Teamster was was formative for me and 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 i hadn't thought about that till you were just telling that story but even to where i am today you know 40 some odd years later 43 years later it was a, one of those formative experiences for which i'm deeply grateful and did it inform your as i you know my guess is it informed your decency your sense of fair play that you recognize uh, the playing field is not level for instance uh, I mean, just real talk. You can come here and wear this Nike T-shirt. Uh, one, it's brand equity. You're the CEO, but you can get away with that. No one questions your credibility, your ethics, your integrity, your your competency, your your styling decisions. But uh, if you're African American, you've got to sit and wonder: Can I get away with wearing a T-shirt on TV? Am I going to be discounted as a lightweight? Or people going to say, "Well, he must be an athlete, or he can't be a business person." Uh, you know, do I have to reinforce uh, the image of being a proper business person because of my uniform? Um, and you, I think, recognize those inequalities in society to this day. And I think that what you've seen growing up has, frankly, just made you more decent. Because what you did at lunch and what Senator Bradley did at lunch uh, was uncalled for. I mean, I, of course, I believe the right thing to do, but you, you didn't have to do it. Is it all connected? Is this all how you grew up inform who you are now? Sure. You know, I, I, because at the end of the day, we're all human. I mean, I, I, the, and, and, you know, you and I were just talking before I came on the, uh, on this dialogue and you were just talking about what you, what you believe so deeply. We need to build bridges, not, not build oceans between us that yes, we may be black, white, brown. We may be, different religious or sexual affiliations, orientations, but at the end of the day, we have to remember first and foremost, we're all human. Yeah. And then if we start with that understanding and then we start with every each one of our experience as a human is different though, where we come from, the opportunities we may have been given or the challenges we may have had, the, 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 uh, as you said, the blessings and the, and the, the adversities we've had to confront. If we bring that human awareness and that human empathy, there's nothing we can't do together. And I think I think that's never been more important. You and I were just talking about this than at this moment in society. And it's actually it's actually why, John, why I ended up joining Nike. Hmm. Um, it's you and I haven't talked about this, but but you know I, I was blessed enough to be Phil Knight asked me on the board five six years ago. And the last mm -hmm. thing in the world was on my mind is being CEO of Nike. You know, I was a good board member and, 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 but then when, when the board and Phil and Mark Parker, my predecessor came to me and asked me to consider this, 
I, you know, I had to reflect and, and I've always been a purpose driven person and a people driven person. Right. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 60 now and I have never seen the world in a more polarized state in my adult life, right? Yeah. More fragmented, polarization is in, it's almost, it's not even just an observation. There's an, it's an active force in our world right now. And that's depressing to me. That's, yeah. that's upsetting to me, you know, and our historical institutions are not able to overcome that. And as I reflected, you know, sport is one of the few things that still brings people together. Yeah. Right. Sports brings people together within nations. Sport brings people together across nations, you know, the Olympics or the World Cup. And sport brings people together on the ultimate level playing field, right? It doesn't matter the color of your skin, your height, your size, your personality. If you can play, you can play. And maybe even most important at this particular moment in our country, you can, you can hate your opponent on the sports field, but you play by a civil set of rules and at the end of the game, after you've competed viciously, you shake hands and thank them. And so as I reflected, John, I sort of felt like the world needs sport today more than it ever has, because it is one of those institutions that is still has credibility and is alive. Yeah. And Nike's at the center of sport. And so the decision to join Nike in my, in my case was very purpose-based because of Nike's purpose of bringing inspiration and innovation to every athlete and asterisk after athlete in the world. And the asterisk on the bottom says, if you have a body, you are an athlete. Hmm. And so, and so this notion of that human potential, just do it and sport being a vehicle to bring people, societies, countries together is sort of, sort of why I've ended up having this wonderful opportunity here. And so it, it does tie almost all the way back to that, those early years. Yeah. And it, it connects all the dots for me. Um, and even before we had a conversation, you know, I, I mean, I, I saw you doing things. You put a friend of mine, the son of the duck it, uh, I believe on your board of directors, African American. She's not a black leader. She's a really smart, great leader in great. banking who happens to be black. Uh, you've done another, other, a few other things around diversity in your board. My guess is you've got targets uh, in, in management. Uh, you've got, uh, I wanna unpack a lot of this stuff. You, you've got an initiative with Michael Jordan that you've launched around social justice. You've got this piece with Colin Kaepernick that you uh, have embarked upon. We don't talk about that. Uh, you've proven by the way, this stuff, all social justice and business can cross pollinate. You can do well and do good too. I believe Collins, you know, a jersey or something came, they, he had recently sold out uh, uh, overnight. Uh, you you've got this um, uh, commitment you made around uh, Nike has made uh, around leaning in to opportunity in these communities. That my guess is with a leadership de decision from you. I I was talking to the CEO of Survey Monkey, who's uh, speaking on this forum, Xander, and he. He was saying that every corporation, you know, ninety percent of all jobs in this country, people don't know this, come from the private sector. For as much as we talk every day about the government, nonstop. I mean, you cannot turn the TV set without seeing the government on display, and people assume because of that, 30 40 percent of jobs must come from the government. The reality is, seven percent of jobs come from the federal government, about five percent from local state, local county, and state. 88 to 90% of all jobs come from the private sector, you and me, and 100% of all legitimate wealth comes from the private sector, not from government. Government gets its money from us to do public good. And, uh, and so having leaders like you lean in today in these ways reminds me of the 60s. Uh, Ambassador Young, who co-hosts this forum, after Dr. King protested, shut down the economy basically in these small towns, uh, at some point the business leader said, we don't care whether, whether you come through the front door or the back door, the color of the currency is green. <laughs> uh, we don't care whether you're white or you're black, the money spends the same, can we cut a deal? 
And Andrew Young, Ambassador Andrew Young, will be sent by Dr. King to go meet with business leaders behind closed doors uh, to, to cut a deal that got that took down the whites only signs. The philosophy here, John, was talk without being offensive, listen without being defensive, and always leave even your adversary with their dignity. Because if you don't, they spend the rest of their life trying to make you miserable. It becomes personal. So this was a, Dr. King set it up. In many ways, Andrew Young helped to pay it off. And the private sector desegregated the South. It wasn't government. It was, it, it, mm. it was business leaders who finally told the mayors and the governors to knock it off, that racism was bad for business. Nike has proved that racism is not only bad for business, but inclusion is good for business. Uh, and I think your numbers reflect it. Do you see, or how do you see, sports and a global multinational company like yours that goes everything from design and manufacturing to sale sales in this space of sports empowerment and lifestyle how do you see nike as a that can be a force for good well so first of all what i love about i love about this john i learn a new thing every day i didn't realize that about segregation and the story you just told so that's uh that's a wonderful learning. Um, you know, I think, I think, as you said a minute ago, we're in, an, and as I said a minute ago, in terms of the society we're in right now, we're in an environment where, where private companies need to engage on social issues. Yep. Because many of the historical institutions that, that either in reality or perception led those things are uh, either in disrepair or are being challenged right now. And so I think that one of the important things for each company to do is to figure out what are those social issues which are directly connected to our purpose as a company or our mission as a company. So you talked about Dan Schulman, right? Financial inclusion is directly connected to PayPal's purpose and mission. Yep. You talked about Doug McMillan and Walmart and what Doug's done on gun control is just so impressive. And it's, it's right, Walmart, as because they do sell guns and and some of their stores, it's core to their mission. Yeah. For Nike, as it turns out, two, the two fundamental tenets of our, our social agenda tie to our purpose and mission. One, we can talk about maybe in a minute, which is youth sport, right? We have make sport a daily habit is one of our core phrases and the importance of, of young people all over the world being active and healthy. And that's one we care deeply about. Mm -hmm. But but more recently, the one that's been front and center is is Nike's belief to stand up for racial justice, social justice and economic justice. And that's not an arbitrary decision. That's partly because of the history and heritage of Nike. If you think about it over the last 40 to 50 years, Nike has celebrated amazing elite athletes all over the world, many of whom, and particularly in the U.S., have been black, right? Michael Jordan, Bo Jackson, Kobe Bryant, Tiger Woods, Serena Williams, LeBron James, Colin Kaepernick. And, and in many ways, those athletes have helped Nike become who Nike is and Nike's connection to, to black culture through the Nike brand and the Jordan brand. And, and our consumer base, we're very clear, our consumer base skews differentially toward black and brown Latinx consumers and, and customers all over the world. And so we believe we have a higher standard we have to hold ourselves to, to speak out on these topics because they are what our history, our athletes, our employees, and our consumers care about. And so whether it was Colin Kaepernick or our Just Don't Do It campaign earlier this year, the reason we're willing to speak out on these topics is because it is so so core to who who Nike is and our purpose as a company to believe in those athletes, to believe in sport, to believe in those cultures, and to believe sport is a way to make society better. And so I think, you know, that's that's why that that particular topic is of such importance and relevance. And I will I will also tell you, John, that this has been the last six months, and by the way, I take no credit for this. I, I just joined you know, Nike, you know, at the beginning of this year, there's a long history and tradition that's deeply ingrained. I will tell you the last six to nine months for me have been some of the most significant learning periods of my life. 
Mm -hmm. Because as much as Nike is a leader externally on these topics, internally, our black teammates tell us we still have room to go. If we're not yet a leader in being a diverse and inclusive culture, we have some very good representation numbers on our board and in our senior management team and at certain parts of our company, but we're not the leader we are externally in standing up for these topics. We need to get our own house in order. And I think we're in a good starting point, but we have a lot of room to go. And so we've said we, our aspiration to be a leader externally on speaking out on racial and social and economic injustice, but we also want to be a leader in being the most diverse and inclusive company in the world. And so that dialogue, that takes, that takes having the uncomfortable conversation, right? That takes the inclusion is a hard thing, the sense of inclusion and belonging. We saw that in the last dance, right? It was so striking to me. There's a Bulls team that have won five rings. <laughs> and yet in the sixth season, you start the season, you got Scotty and Michael and Rodman and Kerr, and they're on the different pages and how hard it was to get on the same page where they all felt in harmony. When they felt in harmony, they won. And when they didn't, they lost. That's mm-hmm. the hard work we're engaging in inside of Nike as well as outside of Nike. And, and that, you know, that's a rich and, and, and um, meaningful dialogue and a rich and meaningful, ende- you know, uh, endeavor. It's very interesting. You mentioned that I, I love the last dance and uh, I've, I've found basketball is a thinker's game and it's a mental game most professional sports are. I consider myself a professional athlete of the brain. <laughs> um, I'm exhausted every day as are you. Uh, um, it's a different part of the body, but the uh, the book that I just wrote that came out last week up from nothing is about that mindset. And it's about trying to get the rest of the black community and the rest of the brown community and the rest of my poor white friends and the rest of the struggling middle class in this country who feel that this country and other countries around the world have not afforded opportunity for them and may be, may have slipped from a winning mindset of their parents or grandparents down to a surviving mindset, right through thriving, which is middle class, uh, and down to, to surviving. And surviving is, is a prescription for just that, just getting by or worse. And you gotta get our, we gotta get our heads back in the game because a winner believed they won something a winner believed they were a winner before they won anything, as did Mr. Jordan. He he believed he was a winner. Pippi thought he was a winner. Pippin, uh, Scotty Pippin, all those from moment one. Somebody vested in them. Somebody poured into them. Somebody said, you can do it. A system was set up for them to nurture. And if you think about it, the groups that, that have succeeded in this country, Blacks, have succeeded through sports and culture precisely because the rules are published and the playing field is level. And what I'm seeing you're doing, there's a city group report that was issued three weeks ago that showed that racism against blacks cost $20 trillion in 20 years. Forget 120 years or 250 years or 350 years, $20 trillion in 20 years. And we can rate, we can make 5 trillion if we just knock racism off against blacks today to make that over the next five years and pay for the coronavirus stimulus money, by the way. You've knocked it off at Nike. Are you trying to knock it off at Nike? If there's any racism, if there's any bias and trying to replace that with inclusion as a business plan, what were you thinking when you saw the board when you came in? What were you thinking when you saw the management team? How did this play in and not only social justice, but a business plan? How does this work with Michael and Colin and even the commitment you just made speak to the business model? Well, you know, John, I think it starts with a deep belief. And I believe there's clear data and evidence now. Diverse and inclusive teams are more successful and more innovative. Mm. Bringing different perspectives, different backgrounds, different combinations, different personalities, different skill sets, different cultures, Mm -hmm. melding together that produces better outcomes. That produces better outcomes for a sports team. You know, the Bulls didn't have five centers. They didn't even have five Michael Jordans. It would have been fun to watch five Michael Jordans, but my guess is five Michael Jordans might not have done any better than 
having one amazing Michael Jordan and surrounding him with incredible complementary skill sets. Yeah. I also think that's true in a business context. And so the diversity and inclusion is not just a nice thing to do because it happens to be, you know, in vogue at the moment. It's the best way to win. Yeah. I would argue it's the only way to win sustainably. So you've got to you got to start with that deep belief. And it's it's funny because sports can teach us so much. We know that on the sports field, right? You know, you pick your you 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 want to have a great point guard and you want to have a great number two guard. You got to have a good, you know, you got to have a good outside shooter. You got to have someone that can rebound inside, and they have to appreciate each other and they have to play together and come together. Yeah, that to me is diversity and inclusion. And so inside, whether it's inside of Nike, our commitment to be a diverse and inclusive culture is because it's it's the best way to win. Yeah. And so that means we need to bring different skill sets and backgrounds and then create an environment where we're we're learning from each other at all times. And as I said, we're doing a pretty good job of that. But I think the next level, this is again what I loved about the last dance. At the beginning of the season, at that particular season, they they weren't having the uncomfortable conversations together. Right. And that's one of the things Phil Jackson did as a head coach. And you saw during that, that they started having the uncomfortable conversations in the locker room and, and connecting with one another and, and allowing each other's similarities and differences. And you just watch that team meld together over that season and go from what started out as a losing starting part of the season to the sixth ring. And so I, I just think that's a wonderful analogy of what all organizations have to do. And it's the important part is this. It's a lot of hard work, yeah. but it's worthy and worthwhile work because it is the best way to seed and the best way to win and the best way to grow as humans and the best way to grow as a, as a team. I deeply believe that. And I can tell you the 75,000 people at Nike, we deeply believe that. And if you had stayed on to that point, I mean, really, the analogy you just made about the last dance is the analogy of America right now. We're finally having a conversation about slavery. We're finally having a conversation about a, a historic, a, a large, I believe the largest reverse transfer of wealth in world history, which was the 246 years where blacks worked for free and got no capital, got no lab, no pay for their labor and so on and so forth. And, and how do we, you can't address, you can't, re, you can't reverse that. How do you address it? And we're finally starting to have these uncomfortable conversations as a family and coming together closer as a result of that. That's what I heard you mention. And that team didn't go from the Bulls to a, from a white team to a black team. It became a white team and a black team and an Asian team. And, a, and the results of all of that diversity widened the scope of opportunity and the bigger GDP for everybody. Everybody won more. So I don't see, I'm not hearing you also saying I'm replacing, you know, white people here tonight. No, no, it, it expand the table and add a seat. <laughs> um, what are some of the specific things you're doing that you want the world to know about now or in the future that underscores how you lean? I love that you said you want to be the most diverse company. I think you said in the world, that's at least your, your aspirational goal. That's bold and audacious and brilliant. What are you doing that you want people to know about? Well, well, John, we're going to try to continue to lead externally, right? Continue to lead by supporting our our incredible athletes that we're honored to be associated with, and the the example they're setting in society. You know, I think with this whole NBA season, it's so great to see LeBron and the Lakers win. And I, I read a, a great article um, the last couple of days that 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 the the writer was saying, you know what is as amazing as what LeBron and the Lakers accomplished on the court this season, in the long march of time, their biggest impact may have been off the court. Yeah. With the Black Lives Matter, the way the players came together, the way they they spoke out in thoughtful ways that encouraged dialogue, the way they role modeled dialogue among themselves. And so we're going to continue to try to support the amazing athletes we're part of. We're going to continue to to invest in, in uh, we're investing with and partnered with Michael Jordan and Nike and the Jordan brand, investing $140 million in, in um, the NAAC Advancement Fund, Black Girls Code, 
other organizations to promote social and economic justice yeah. um, in the black community and in our society. But I will tell you, in some ways, the external stuff, as I mentioned earlier, is the easier piece. Yeah. Um, we'll continue to do it. It's always been part of who Nike is and the Jordan brand is and the Converse brand, and we will continue to do it. The sum of the work we're doing internally is just what you're talking about, which is, yes, we, we publish representation goals. Mm -hmm. We publish each year our the representation on our board of directors, across our VP team, across different levels of management. And we will continue to make market improvement in becoming a more diverse and representative team at every level of the organization. And, and on one hand, I'm very proud of where we are and the progress we've made. On the other hand, we know that we have a long way to go to where we're truly reflective of the society. I think the harder work though, I'll come back to the same thing. It's then what do we do once we're all in the locker room together? Mm. And that's where having the uncomfortable conversation, that is the, that's the starting point of, I think, building a diverse and inclusive team and society where we say, you know what, we're all on the Nike, Jordan and Converse team. So let's remember, that's the first thing. We're on the same team. Right. That should give us permission to have a very uh, rich and honest and sometimes vulnerable conversation with one another about some of the issues you're talking about. I will tell you, the dialogues that happen inside of Nike, and I know this is true of so many organizations, after the events around George Floyd's killing, mm. there was more rich dialogue, compassion, empathy, tears, understanding, learning, grappling than I've ever seen. Mm. And I know I emerged feeling like I was a, a more compassionate and understanding person out of it and a more compassionate, understanding leader. I think a whole organization realized that this, this was a positive step for us, painful step, but a positive step to begin a greater level of mutual understanding. And now how do we build on that? That's the, that's the hard work we're engaged in right now. How do we build on that? I'm glad you're there. And I'm glad you're there right now. Um, I was a little shocked when I saw the move, but not surprised uh, because you're always looking around the corner. And uh, I'm glad that the people who are participating in this forum and watching it around the world are seeing not only your intellect uh, and your commitment, but also your humanity. Uh, uh, none of this is scripted. You know, this is all just me, me, me and John having a conversation. You're seeing it. You're seeing it as it's happening, and you're you can judge <laughs> yourself the the realness of the person that you're you're hearing this from as a CEO of, of, of Nike. What to me this is a, you didn't have to do this, uh, so this is a bit of a legacy piece in my opinion. Uh, that, you, that you know, what do you want to be known for? What did you leave to society? As we close, as we wrap up, is there anything that you want people to know? about your mark that you want to leave. You're, you're, you're already using the what I call the, the balance sheet or the budget of uh, Nike to express what you believe the company should articulate as its values. Uh, you've done some things that, again, board level with the About Us page, the board level, uh, some, some work still needs to be done in management, I'm hearing, and with line employees external investments um but what else in your opinion describes the magic sauce what is that intangible thing that you want people to remember about your mark at nike and what nike as a company is all about well john it goes back to the purpose it goes back to the purpose and where we started, which is in many ways, you could argue in the last 30, 40 years, sport has been the thing we did in our free time. Sport, sport has been entertainment. Sport has been enjoyment. And I, I deeply believe that right now, sport can be the role model of what we need as a society. Sport bringing people together, 
right? Civil, like we said, level playing field, common set of rules, shake hands at the end. Sport, sports teams can be examples of how you have the uncomfortable conversation. Yeah. And how you have it inside the locker room before the game and at halftime. And when you come out, you're a team. You have each other's back. It's not divisive, but it's very real. It's very real. And so I think, as I said earlier, sports, these elite sports, athletes and sport in general can can be a, a source of hope and inspiration for our world right now. And when and many of the other institutions are not offering a lot of hope and ins, inspiration. I also think another topic we haven't talked about that's just core to Nike's um, uh, purpose is the importance of movement, of health, of sport, particularly mm-hmm. in youth. You know, we're in an environment right now where a lot of youth don't have access to places where they can have healthy exercise. They aren't getting enough exercise. And that's often true in many of the inner cities. That's true, uh, particularly of young girls, that they're dropping out of sport and activity at young ages. Mm-hmm. And that's that's just not, that's not healthy. And I'm particularly concerned about that with this pandemic, because so many of the youth sport leagues and you know, young high schools and grade schools, you know, the, 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 the playgrounds are closed right now. And Nike's got a really strong commitment toward youth sports and, and wellness and well-being. And so that we're, we're, we're trying to help facilitate that and invest. And we invested over $400 million over the past five years in ensuring that there's facilities in inner cities and cities all over the world that, that investing in coaching programs, um, so that young boys and girls have coaches that encourage them at young ages. And I just think that's also part, there's societal health and there's individual health. And, and we view, you know, Nike views our role to really help contribute through sport in both those, in both those arenas. And it's deeply felt, it's heartfelt by, by so many people across Nike. I feel so deeply uh, honored and fortunate and grateful to be able to be part of this. And I think, I think the world's never needed it more. And so we get up every day trying to do our part to contribute toward a better, a better society, a better humanity. You know, I, I, uh, again, my new book, I talk about everybody wants to be an American, but Americans, and we're so busy throwing rocks at each other and complaining about each other and criticizing each other and pointing fingers at each other. And this, the Bible says a house divided cannot stand. This only benefits certain countries I won't mention that would love to see us divided so they can take our place. They complain about America because they want to be America. They want our way of life. They want this conversation. They want our spirit. They want our freedom. They want our aspiration. They want our opportunity. They want our sports teams, (laughs) Um, uh, our GDP. Only we can give that up. They can't take it. We, we've got to shoot ourselves in the foot. We got to screw up the, the magic sauce by playing games with each other. And I don't mean games on courts. And what you're saying, what this last piece you said about coming together uh, and using sports as that place where you can have, yes, a social justice uh, symbolism, but also a societal healing whether you're black and brown urban or you're poor white rural or you're struggling middle class uh, or you're the, ch- the children of some of the wealthiest people in the world, you're all watching that game. You're all rooting for the same team uh, or a team. You all are, your endorphins are kicking in the same way. And in a, for a moment, we're one. Let's extend that thread and re- redefine redefine our culture and expand opportunity for all and heal a nation. And I'm gonna ask you personally to do me a consideration, which is um, talk to other leaders, continue to do that. What you did uh, with Dan, Dan need, didn't need a speech, Dan is, Dan is self-actualized, but there are certain leaders who don't get what we're talking about here, John. I hope they're sitting here watching, taking notes no, no embarrassment here. Where they are, they're by the What you said, how you've led, because it's worked for you, and it and it's working even more for companies that embrace these philosophies. This, 
Inclusion is profitable. It builds wealth. It also makes you sleep better at night. <laughs> um, I would encourage you to, 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 to put on your call list once a month, a CEO or two, you've seen flubbing it, not getting it, leaning in because they'll listen to you. And, uh, and I just want to thank you for the stuff that you're doing that we see and the stuff that you're not doing that uh, hopefully I've exposed a little bit about and embarrassed you a little bit uh, with, uh, with, with your, your, your people seeing your, your heart and not just your, your brilliant head. Thank you, uh, John, for all you do. Thanks, Nike, Nike, and let's go change the world together. Amen. And, and John, thank you for everything you do and your inspiration to me personally and to so many others. And, and, uh, and please continue to do the work you're doing to inspire all of us.